Optimancers, Chris here. So, on Friday I released an in-depth look and analysis of the Rules Glossary from the new Expert Classes 1 D&D playtest, and I want to continue with an in-depth look at the feats highlighted in that document. This playtest was a large document, and the Rules Glossary itself, which I basically flew through in my analysis, still meant a video of over half an hour just to highlight the big changes. And that's just the kind of document this is. This stuff here wasn't just lengthy, but these are big changes that foreshadow a very different game come the release of the new Player's Handbook in 2024. And that brings us to the feats section. There are 50 of them. In just this one document, 50 feats. That's more than all the feats in the whole Player's Handbook. Of those feats, 7 are first level feats, 13 are the 20th level epic boon feats, and 30 are 4th level feats. So, for your sanity, and for mine, I'm covering the 4th level feats in this video, and then I'm going to cover the 1st level and epic boon feats in my next video. And in my next video, I will kind of wrap up by talking about feats in general. If you like this kind of content, and you'd be interested in supporting it, please find the link to my Patreon page in the video description. Patrons see these videos early and without the YouTube ads. Additional perks, depending on your level of support, include an exclusive Discord community and getting recognized in these videos, which I'm going to do right now. Today I want to thank Airhead, Alex R, Rob Reichelt, Awesome Face, Barbar, Ben Potts, Benjamin, Bloody Nine, Brett McDowell, Atherazone, CJ, Chris Coons, Christian Windham, Unknown Watcher, Daniel Sturgeon, Dank Train, Dash Panther, Dave Peters, David Edgar, David F, David Lotz, David W. Skibbins, Dewey Cheatman Howe, Douglas Reynolds, Drew Terry, Eric Wasserman, and FBK05. Thank you all so much for your support. Let's get started. So let's cover some basics about the feats in 1D&D that we should probably go over before we get started here. First, feats in 1D&D have an assigned level. This is the level your character needs to be before you take the feat. In this document, 30 of the feats have the requirement of 4th level, which is what I'm going to be going over in this video. Now it's unclear if there's going to be 8th level, 12th level, 16th level, and or 19th level feats, but I think there might, and that is potentially a lot of feats. Also, in 1D&D, you get a feat as part of your background, so any character will start with at least one first level feat at character creation. Feats also often have additional prerequisites in order to be taken. I find this seems to be more common in the playtest than in the current rules. And what I see most are either ability score requirements or weapon proficiency requirements, but they're not on every feat. So time to speculate a bit. I expect the level and other prerequisites for feats are all going to stay. I expect the feat at first level as part of your background is also going to stick around. As for feats between 4th and 20th level, not sure. But my guess is there's going to be feats, and they're likely going to start to include feats being prerequisites for other feats, so you'll get feats that kind of build on other feats. Finally, in this document, it suggests that every 30,000 experience points a character receives after 20th level, the character would gain an additional feat, or epic boon feat, and this is kind of presented as an optional rule for DMs. This isn't much different than the Dungeon Master's Guide recommending those epic boons for continued rewards after achieving 20th level. In fact, the 20th level feats we see in this document are based on the existing epic boons. I'm going to go through the mere 30 4th level feats in this document. I'll also go over what the feat does in 5th edition and highlight how it's changed. I mean beyond having it have a 4th level requirement. Uh, because I'm not going to mention that 30 times. But I'll also let you know if I'm really pleased or disappointed with the design of the feat. But I'm going to be more reluctant to evaluate power levels of feats. Because, I mean, the most basic rule of optimization is you need to know the rules in order to optimize. And we just don't know most of the rules for 1D&D yet. The first feat I want to cover is the ability score improvement feat. Which is technically a 4th level feat. Calling ability score improvements a feat is semantics. Whether you choose an ability score improvement or a feat, or whether ability score improvements are represented by a feat, makes no mechanical difference. And this is mechanically identical to choosing an ability score increase in 5th edition. What this does make clear, or clearer because I think this was already pretty obvious, 
is that feats are not an optional rule in 1D&D. Though Jeremy Crawford said something in a recent interview that makes me think they're at least considering an optional rule limiting characters to the ability score improvement feat after level 1, but even that would be a change in direction, making feats the standard. The actor feat is very similar thematically to 5th edition, but there are mechanical changes. First, the prerequisite is new, now you need minimum 13 charisma to qualify. The ability score increase is the same. The impersonation portion has changed. It used to be advantage on charisma deception and performance checks while trying to impersonate a different person. Now it includes the requirement that you're disguised and is advantage on performance checks only. This might be because passing yourself off as another person is going to be specifically a feature of the performance skill. We don't know yet. The mimicry feature is also a bit different. The requirement of listening for one minute is the same, but it used to involve a contested deception versus insight check, and now it's a DC 15 performance check, and if you make the check, you're set for an hour. This continues what we've seen in the playtest so far, in that everything that used to be a contested check is now replaced, making me think that contested checks are going to be gone entirely. Then again, in the hiding rules in this playtest, the DC to find a hidden character was the result of their hide check, which is kinda a contested role, I suppose. Ultimately, though, this feat, in terms of how it performs, is very similar to the existing actor feat. The athlete feat is very thematically similar, again with relatively minor mechanical changes. The prerequisite, again, is new, requiring strength, dexterity, or constitution of 13 or higher. I mean, that's an easy requirement. We get a new option with our ability score increase. It didn't previously provide an option for constitution. Now it does. The climb speed is basically the same, except now it's specifically defined as a climbing speed. Before it just said climbing didn't cost extra movement. Considering the new movement rules, this is actually worse, since you can't use a climb speed with the same movement you use to walk. Hop up is the new name for a mechanically identical feature, standing up from prone with 5 feet of movement. The bonus to jumping has changed. Previously, it reduced the movement requirement for a running long or high jump to 5 feet, and now, instead, it provides advantage on an ability check you make for the jump action. If you don't know what the jump action is, you should have watched my rules glossary video. It's my last video. Overall, this is okay. It seems like the mechanics here are pretty clear, pretty easy to use. Now, the charger feat is infamous as one of the worst feats in 5th edition. It was a full feat and it let you make a bonus action, attack, or shove when you took the dash action. And it provided a damage boost or a 10-foot shove if you moved at least 10 feet in a straight line before taking that bonus action. It was really not good. So let's look at the redesign. First, the prerequisite is new. We're seeing that a lot. Second, it's now a half feet. So you get a plus one to strength or dexterity. Third, now your dash is improved, increasing your speed by 10 feet four dash actions. And now if you move 10 feet in a straight line, you get a bonus to an attack that hits using the attack action. You can either get a d8 extra damage or push a target 10 feet just by hitting it with your weapon as long as they're no more than one size larger than you. You can use either effect only once on your turns. Now, they made a mistake here. This should say before hitting with a melee attack. Instead, it just says hitting with an attack which means we can move back 10 feet and then fire our longbow and we would get this bonus, <laughs> which makes no sense. So designers, if you are watching, this should obviously be a bonus for melee attacks, but that's not what you did here. So you probably should fix that up. Now, if you noticed, I've been hesitant saying which feats are good or bad up to now. That's not an omission. It's because without the rest of the play test, these things are hard to gauge. However, here I am confident saying this feat is at least way better than it was. As we go into the rest of our feat options here, if I was using a melee weapon, this is absolutely a feat I would strongly consider. And that's something. Okay, crossbow expert. We have a lot to talk about. First, let's talk about what didn't change. Ignoring the loading property of crossbows is unchanged, except now it no longer specifies you need to be proficient which is fine. Nobody's using a crossbow, taking the crossbow expert feat, and isn't proficient in crossbows. And that's it. Everything else is different. 
So the prerequisite is new, and I find it strange. If you are proficient in the light crossbow, you don't qualify for this feat. If you're proficient in the halberd, you do. If you're going to have a prerequisite, maybe it should be related to crossbows specifically, because this does not make sense to me. The ability score increase is new. This is now a half feat and provides a plus one to your dexterity score. That's nice. Firing in melee is probably the same, at least in practice, for most characters who took the crossbow expert feat. The change is now it's limited to crossbows, which makes sense, but in 5th edition, I've seen non-crossbow using builds that take this feat for that feature because it wasn't restricted to crossbows. Now here's the big one, dual wielding. Used to be that you could make a bonus action attack with a hand crossbow as long as you use the attack action to attack with a one-handed weapon, which was generally the same hand crossbow. Now it says, when you make the extra attack of the light weapon property, you add your ability modifier to the damage of the extra attack if that attack is with a crossbow that has light property, which, if the rules for that remain unchanged, is the hand crossbow. Now here's where I have a problem. Maybe. I mean, we haven't seen the ammunition property, uh, so maybe it's going to change. Or maybe even the ammunition property isn't going to exist anymore. We don't know. But if it does, this is super clunky. You see, the ammunition property says, and I quote, You need a free hand to load a one-handed weapon. So how are we dual wielding a hand crossbow with anything? And I mean, unfortunately, there is a way to do it, and it requires you being ridiculous. So you equip the hand crossbow in your right hand, you shoot it, then you drop it, and then you equip a different hand crossbow in your left hand and shoot it using the light property. That technically would fulfill the light weapon property extra attack rules, and this needs to change because that's idiotic. Here's a proposal on how it could be fixed. So it could say dual wielding. While holding a light melee weapon in one hand, and you make the extra attack of the light weapon property with a crossbow with that property in the other hand, you may ignore the ammunition property of that weapon and add your ability modifier to the damage of that extra attack. Now that might be a bit wordy, but I think it ultimately does what the designers seem to be going for here, which is a character using a light melee weapon in one hand and a hand crossbow in the other hand. Anyways, this one just doesn't really work as written, or it works using a ridiculous workaround for two crossbows at once. As far as I'm concerned, I think it needs a redesign. Okay, so let's move on to Defensive Duelist. Here the prerequisite is the same as the 5th edition version, and the parry feature is worded a bit differently, but it's effectively the same. What's different is that it's now a half feat, and it provides a plus one to your dexterity. Now this may be a really good feat. It depends. In 5th edition, we have a reaction that adds a plus five bonus to your armor class for an entire round against every attack that you face in that round. This doesn't compare to that. But so far, we just don't have enough to compare this to. Okay, so, Dual Wielder. Here is a feat we seldom see in 5th edition. The current version provides a plus one bonus to armor class when you're using two weapon fighting. It allows you to use two weapon fighting with weapons that aren't light, and it allows you to draw or stow two weapons at once. I am not a fan of this feat. So, this version adds a martial weapon proficiency prerequisite, which may be an issue for bards now, but I don't know why anyone would take this feat. It, I mean, it provides a plus one bonus to strength or dexterity. That's a nice boost, but what else do we get? Well, it allows you to treat a weapon you're holding in one hand as if it had the light property, as long as the weapon you're holding in your other hand has the light property. So instead of being able to use two long swords, you would use like one long sword and one short sword, for example. This is worse than the current dual wielder feat, at least from an optimization standpoint. And even that wasn't great, but here we're getting very little benefit. But we do get one other feature. The quick draw feature is a repeat of the drawing or stowing two weapons. So yeah, I just have mixed feelings about this feat. I mean, making this a half feat helps, but honestly, I don't see the point of it. Enhanced dual wielding is fine 
I guess, thematically. I like the idea of one light weapon and one heavier weapon, though mechanically it is a really tiny boost. But quick draw here. This is pointless. The rules glossary fixed the drawing two weapons problem already with the change to the attack action, which allows you to equip a weapon for any attack. We don't need quick draw anymore. And let me be clear, it's great we don't need it. But if we don't need it, then this is one rapier instead of a short sword, and that's it. That is not enough for a feat, even a half feat. I mean, look what Charger gave us, and it's a half feat. Maybe put the plus one armor class back in or something, because even if I'm making a two-weapon fighter, I'm not sure why I'd bother with this feat at all. On to another feat that was really bad in 5th edition, the durable feat. The prerequisite is new, and honestly, it makes sense. How's your low constitution character? Durable, exactly. The plus one constitution is the same as it was. And the 5th edition version allows you to add twice your constitution modifier when expending hit dice on a short rest, which was really lackluster. Here as a replacement, we get advantage on death saving throws and a bonus action that allows us to expend a hit die and recover that many hit points. Now, I think it's important to point out that the speedy recovery provides fewer hit points than expending the hit die over short rest because you're not adding your constitution modifier. Overall, I think this is better than it was, but even if we look at what we've seen already, like the Barkskin spell giving us temporary hit points every round, I'm not seeing this as a very potent feat, but I do think it's an improvement. The Elemental Adept feat has a slightly different prerequisite. Before you needed the ability to cast at least one spell, now it requires the spellcasting or pack magic feature. This prerequisite makes more sense honestly. Like before, you can take the feat multiple times if you choose a different damage type. This time though, it's a half feat and you get a plus one to a mental ability score, so that's nice. Otherwise, the feat is the same. Choose a damage type, ignore resistance to that type with spells you cast, and any ones on damage rolls for spell damage are treated as twos. So is adding a plus one ability score modifier enough to make Elemental Adept a decent feat? Hmm, I think so. Okay, so here's an interesting one. The grappler feat, once again, was always considered one of the weakest feats. It basically allowed you to attempt to pin a creature you had grappled, which was an unpopular mechanic to say the least, and you had advantage on attack rolls against a creature you were grappling, which I guess removed the requirement of knocking them prone, but altogether it just wasn't worth a feat. So here we see a prerequisite of strength or dexterity of 13 or higher, it used to be just strength, but considering it's going to be theoretically possible to grapple now with a dexterity attack, I mean, that is assuming monks still make unarmed strikes with the option to use dexterity, then this makes sense. So the advantage to attack a creature you're grappling is unchanged, but look at all you get to replace the pin mechanic. First, you get an ability score increase to either of the prerequisite ability scores. Second, you aren't slowed when you move a creature you're grappling as long as it's not a larger size than you. And third, when you make an unarmed strike as part of the attack action, once on your turns, you can do both the damage and grapple the target. This feat did super well. I can see monks really grabbing this and then dragging creatures all over the map with that fast wrestler. Punch and grab is probably as good as having an extra attack if you were planning to grapple with one of those attacks. Yeah, I really like this one. The design is cool, and I think it should be really effective if grappling is what you want to do. Most grappler builds in 5th edition don't even bother with the grappler feat, and I think that's definitely going to change in 1 D&D. Okay, so let's move on to a feat that is getting all the wrong kind of attention right now, the Great Weapon Master feat. So a quick reminder, in 5th edition this gave you a bonus action attack with a melee weapon when you reduced a creature to 0 hit points or scored a critical hit with it, and it provided the option of taking a minus 5 penalty to hit with a heavy weapon in order to get a plus 10 bonus to damage. So, yeah, some big changes here, dramatic changes, that I'm going to come back to right after this commercial break. Okay, so here's our new version. We have a martial weapon prerequisite, which makes sense. The bonus action attack portion is exactly the same. But the minus 5 plus 10 option is now replaced with a plus one strength ability score increase 
and a bonus to damage equal to your proficiency bonus with a heavy weapon once on your turns. So to be clear, this means the 5th edition standard of a heavy weapon melee character using this along with advantage to get huge damage numbers, it's no longer a thing. But I think this needs to be said. Compared to the other feats we see here centered around different kinds of weapon use, this is honestly a decent feat. I am sorry to everyone who wanted me to crap on this. I'll have more to say regarding this at the end of my next video, but for now, I'll say that if you want your character to use a heavy weapon, then this is a reasonable option. But it ceases to be the only good option for melee. And again, I'm sorry to say this, but as far as I'm concerned, that's a good thing. Now, I will say it's not the direction I expected the designers to take. If you had asked me a month ago, I would have guessed that the weaker character options would all get boosted, and the powerful options would remain largely intact. That's not the direction the designers seem to be taking. Instead, we get a pull towards the middle from both sides. And it's too early to conclude that the minus 5 plus 10 mechanic is gone from the game. I mean, we haven't even seen the Warrior Class Group playtest yet. But it does appear that it's at least gone from Great Weapon Master. So let's move on to Heavily Armored. Okay, so this feat was never great. And here they've given the option for Constitution in addition to Strength for the Ability Score increase, but otherwise it's identical. So does this mean this feat isn't great? Well, it depends. I have not seen the armor rules yet. If they stay the same, then yeah, it's not great. Next up is Heavy Armor Master. So in 5th edition, this requires heavy armor proficiency, provides a plus 1 to strength, and you reduce non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage by 3 when you're wearing heavy armor. Now the feat allows a choice between strength or constitution for the plus 1, and the damage reduction has changed your proficiency bonus, and we no longer care if the damage is magical. I like this. This is better design. I like the option to choose constitution. I like the change from the flat plus 3 to proficiency bonus, even if it means when I first get this, it might give me a smaller bonus. And I like removing the non-magical requirement. So, as far as design goes, I am happy with this. On to Inspiring Leader. So, in 5th edition, this had a prerequisite of Charisma of 13 or higher, and you could use it to boost up to 6 creatures at a time, including yourself, with temporary hit points equal to your level plus your Charisma bonus after any short or long rest. Now the prerequisite can be either Charisma or Wisdom, and now it includes a plus 1 to either Charisma or Wisdom. I am happy for the ability score increase, but why is Wisdom an option for the prerequisites and increase? The feat is Inspiring Leader, not Careful Planner. I guess to me, the idea of being good at encouragement and inspiring others is something I would identify as a quality of being charismatic. However, the big thing here is the temporary hit points this provides are significantly changed. Now it is 2d4 plus your proficiency bonus, which means at low levels it will provide more temporary hit points, but the scaling is going to be a lot slower. To illustrate that, in 5th edition, a 20th level character could expect to provide 25 temporary hit points, and now you would expect about 11. I should also note that there was kind of a weird loophole that's been closed. You used to read a creature couldn't benefit from the inspiration more than once per rest, but you could potentially inspire way more than 6 creatures just by using the feature over and over. Now it's the leader themselves limited by the rest, which makes more sense. I think Inspiring Leader was a good feat until the Twilight Cleric came along, and I think this is a good feat, provided Twilight Clerics aren't around. On to Keen Mind, which used to provide a plus one intelligence, always knowing the direction of north, always knowing the hours before the next sunset or sunrise, and perfect memory recall for up to a month. Now we include an intelligence prerequisite, so that makes sense, and we still get the ability score bonus, and everything else is different. We get a bonus skill proficiency, and if we already have that skill, then we get expertise, and we can take the study action as a bonus action. And I think these are great changes. I particularly like the study action boost. Requiring an action for the options with the study action is a pretty big limitation. And when you have that limit, then even reducing it to a bonus action is quite good. This is the feat I want for a character who is an expert in monster lore. 
Okay, so let's move on to another feat that was unpopular in 5th edition, the Mage Slayer feat. The 5th edition version provides a reaction attack against a creature casting a spell within 5 feet of you. When you do damage to a creature concentrating on a spell, you impose disadvantage on the concentration save, and advantage on saving throws against spells cast by creatures within 5 feet. Now, we have a martial weapon proficiency prerequisite, which is fine. We get a plus 1 to strength or dexterity, so that's nice. Concentration Breaker mimics the 5th edition feat regarding imposing disadvantage on concentration saves. And then Guarded Mind, that one is interesting. If you fail an Intelligence, Wisdom, or Charisma saving throw, you can succeed instead once per long rest. So basically it's like Legendary Resistance for one of those saves once per long rest. And I think that's pretty cool. It's something we haven't seen so far as far as player options go. I'm glad to see it. Okay, Medium Armor Master. In 5th edition, this has a Medium Armor Proficiency requirement, of course, removes the disadvantage that some Medium Armors cause on stealth checks, and increases the maximum Dexterity bonus to Armor class from 2 to 3 for Medium Armor. Here we have the same prerequisite, of course. We now get a Strength or Dexterity bonus of plus 1, and the maximum Dexterity bonus to Armor class gets the same bonus. Now, Reading this makes me wonder if some medium armors are still going to impose disadvantage on your stealth checks. Because if they don't, that would explain why they got rid of that feature. Overall though, it used to be okay, and it's probably a bit better now because of the ability score boost. I think it, this is alright. Moving on, we have Mounted Combatant. The 5th edition version gives advantage on melee attack rolls against unmounted creatures smaller than your mount, allows you to force attacks against your mount to target you instead, and basically gives your mount evasion. So half damage on a failed dexterity save, or no damage on a successful one. Now, we add the prerequisite of a martial weapon proficiency. We get strength, dexterity, or wisdom increased by 1. Mount Handler gives us advantage on animal handling checks made to handle or train mounts. Mounted Strike adds a restriction of the target of your attack being within 5 feet, but it doesn't need to be a melee attack anymore, so your crossbow expert could get advantage, I guess. This one makes me wonder how lances are going to be handled in 1 D&D. And then Leap Aside is basically the same evasion feature. The only mechanical change is it specifies your mount can't be incapacitated either, which makes sense. And Veer is the big change. Now redirecting an attack against your mount occurs after the attack hits, but it uses your reaction. That's a significant limitation. Overall, I think this feat has even less likelihood of keeping your warhorse alive than it did in 5th edition. So we're really going to need to see those mounted combat rules as well as the warhorse statistics, but from this alone, my concerns with the existing mounted combatant feat are definitely not alleviated here. Okay, so that takes us to Observant. This used to increase our wisdom or intelligence by 1, gave us the ability to read lips, and provided a plus 5 bonus to passive perception, and this one was weird, passive investigation. Now this is the search variant to the keen mind feat. We get proficiency in a skill and expertise if we already had it, and we can take the search action as a bonus action. Now, based on the options in the search action versus the study action, I just see way less benefit to being able to do it as a bonus action. I mean, the feat isn't terrible, but just way less exciting than Keen Mind, in my opinion. Okay, so this one is a big change. Polar Master is considered a must-have feat by optimizers with many melee builds, and even some non-melee builds because of some weird interactions that were possible with opportunity attacks. So basically, it gave a bonus action attack with a glaive, halberd, quarterstaff, or spear that did a d4 damage and it caused enemies who entered your reach, if you're using any of those weapons, or a pike, to provide an opportunity attack from you. And this was super abusable. So now, it requires proficiency in a martial weapon. Again, like with crossbow expert, why not require proficiency in a polearm or a reach weapon? Just saying. So now we get a strength boost to plus one, that's nice. Pulse Strike is basically the bonus action attack, except now it is limited to weapons with the reach and heavy properties. So pikes are in, and quarterstaffs and spears are out. 
I mean, unless we have changes to two weapon properties. And Reactive Strike gives you a reaction attack when a creature enters your reach with a weapon with those same properties that you're wielding. This is a change in that this portion of the feat now probably works as intended instead of opening up all the gamey stuff that the old version did. As far as I'm concerned, good decision. I think this is still a really good feat. It is less abusable, and it probably fits thematically better by actually requiring the use of a heavy reach weapon. So I think they did a good job here. Okay, Resilient. It is identical to 5th edition beyond the 4th level requirement. This is the only feat that changed not at all. Now it has always been a go-to feat for me, and it probably will continue to be a go-to feat. So why do I hedge my bets here with a probably? Well, because I haven't seen spells or the monster manual yet. Are we still making saving throws constantly? Also, currently we can count on most saving throws we make being wisdom, dexterity, or constitution. Is that going to be the case? Or will it be more evenly distributed? If it is, then this feat is actually going to be harder to pin down. Basically, it is impossible to optimize without knowing the rules. And we still just know a tiny portion of the rules. Moving on, Ritual Caster. In 5th edition, it requires either an Intelligence or Wisdom of 13, and it provides you a ritual book. You choose Bard, Cleric, Druid, Sorcerer, Warlock, or Wizard. Who's choosing Sorcerer? Nobody! And then you get two first-level spells with the ritual tag from that list. Then anytime you come across a spell scroll or a spell book with ritual spells from the class list you chose, then you could add it to your ritual book, costing 50 gold pieces and 2 hours per level of the spell. You could cast any of the spells in your ritual book, provided you cast them as rituals. You need to hold a ritual book while casting those spells. Okay, so now the prerequisite includes the option of Charisma, and we get an ability score increase on any of our mental ability scores. The ritual book is gone. Instead, you just get two first level spells with the ritual tag from one of the three big spell lists. You always have the spells prepared and you can cast them with your spell slots. Of course, because they're prepared, because of the rules glossary, it is unnecessary to add that yes, you can cast them as rituals. Then you get the ability to cast any ritual spell you prepared with its regular casting time without expending the spell slot once per long rest. Now. Are we getting some amazing first level rituals? Will find familiar be unchanged? Because I gotta say, overall this seems a lot less impressive than the 5th edition feat, but we'll see. Here's a feat I think did really well, Sentinel. So previously this feat was considered to be fairly solid. It caused a creature speed to become zero for the rest of a turn if you hit them with an opportunity attack. Disengage didn't allow creatures to leave your reach without provoking an opportunity attack, and if a creature within 5 feet of you made an attack against a creature other than you without the sentinel feat, then you got a reaction attack. Now sentinel requires proficiency in a martial weapon, which makes sense. You can increase your strength or dexterity by 1, so that's a nice little boost. Guardian combines both the ignoring disengage and the reaction attack against a creature that attacks an ally. The only real difference here is the ignoring disengage didn't used to have the 5 foot limit, which makes a difference if you are using a reach weapon. And halt remains the same. Now, there used to be a pretty nasty combination using sentinel plus polar master and a reach weapon to impose the zero speed before the enemy could get to you. That loophole is closed, since the polar master reaction attack isn't an attack of opportunity anymore, and that is probably a good thing. Overall, though, this seems super solid. It is mostly the same, plus an ability score increase. Okay, so this is going to ruffle some feathers. The Sharpshooter feat has consistently been ranked as one of the most powerful feats in 5th edition. I don't think it is going to achieve that ranking in 1 D&D. The 5th edition feat allowed you to attack with a ranged weapon at long range without disadvantage. It allowed you to ignore half and three quarters cover. And the big one... It allowed you to take a minus 5 penalty to hit to increase your damage by plus 10. So I have a lot to say about this. And I like to think I'm a thoughtful person, good at analyzing things, which is why I'll be back right after this commercial break. Okay, here's what's the same. You can still make a long range attack without disadvantage. You can still ignore half and three quarters cover. Here's what's changed. The minus 5 plus 10 option is gone. Instead, you get a plus one dexterity, 
and you can attack within 5 feet of an enemy with a ranged weapon without disadvantage. So, like with Great Weapon Master, you lose the minus 5 plus 10, but at least in that case you had some kind of damage bonus. Here, there is no damage bonus. I mean, I guess technically if your plus 1 dexterity boosts your dexterity bonus, I guess that's a damage bonus, but I mean, there's no flat damage bonus here. Now, if I'm using a ranged weapon, I have to wonder, do I even want this feat? I think so. Bypassing cover is a big deal, and depending on the weapon I'm using, the long shots feature could be useful as well. However, if I am using a crossbow, and I took crossbow expert, the redundancy of firing in melee, it just feels terrible. From a design perspective, I would think either sharpshooter should be something for ranged weapons that aren't crossbows, or that aspect of the feats shouldn't be duplicated. Because, of course, a crossbow user wants both feats, but you throw on this firing in melee thing, which maybe didn't need to be there, and it feels like you're being swindled if you take both feats. Now again, I should caution, we don't know how weapons are going to compare to spells, we just don't have that information. But I would encourage changing the firing in melee portion of this feat to do something else. I mean, you could just have it do the proficiency bonus damage like with Great Weapon Master, or something else. Anything else. That's my thoughts on it anyways. Let's move on. Shield Master. The 5th edition version gave us a bonus action shove with our shield when we took the attack action. Jeremy Crawford went back and forth on whether this could be done before, during, or after that attack action. You got your shield's armor class bonus to a dexterity saving throw against a harmful effect that get this, targets only you. Seriously. <laughs> and you could use your reaction to take no damage if you made a saving throw when a dexterity save would normally allow half damage. I mean, it wasn't a bad feat, but it was a bit of a mess in terms of design. Here's what we have now. First, we had a prerequisite of shield training. Well, <laughs> that, hopefully that's not a problem. Then we get a strength increase of plus one. Shield Bash is changed. First, we only get it if we hit with an attack, so that answers the question about whether we need to attack first. And the enemy makes a strength saving throw or is knocked prone or pushed five feet. You can only do this once on your turn, but it doesn't use your bonus action. And Interpose Shield gives us the reaction to take no damage instead of half on a successful saving throw. The shield bonus to dexterity saving throws against spells and harmful effects that target only us, is now removed. I mean, this basically does the same stuff, but is way cleaner. They got rid of the pointless feature, they gave you a bonus to strength, and then there's the shove, which needed change because shoves no longer work the same, now doesn't use your bonus action, which is pretty great, honestly. Overall, I like what I see here. And we are now down to the final five. The Skulker feat. In fifth, you needed a dexterity of 13 to qualify. It allowed you to hide when you were lightly obscured, even though 5th edition has no rules regarding the obscurement levels required for hiding. Though we kind of figured out that at least lightly obscured shouldn't be enough, otherwise what was the point of this feat? If you are hidden and you make an attack and miss, you remain hidden, and dim light doesn't impose disadvantage on your perception checks. Now we see the prerequisite is the same, now we get a dexterity increase. We get blind sight of 10 feet. That's pretty solid. Anytime we take the hide action in combat, we get advantage. And the part about attacking from hidden and missing, that remains the same. I'm satisfied with this. Skulker was a feat that needed some fixing, and this is nice and clear. Though, you know what? Now it is actually spelled out in the hiding rules that you normally would need heavy obscurement or three quarters or more cover. So I'm going to miss the option to hide in Light Obscurement. I mean, if Light Obscurement is even a thing in 1 d maybe Light Obscurement won't exist at all. We don't know. Next, the Speedster feat. You can't fool me. This is a rewrite of the mobile feat, folks. So the mobile feat increased your speed by 10 feet, allowed you to use the dash action to move across difficult terrain without expending extra movement, and it allowed you to avoid opportunity attacks from a creature for the rest of the turn if you made a melee attack against it. So, here are the changes. First, 
now we have a prerequisite of dexterity or constitution, we also get a boost to one of those same scores. The speed increase is almost the same, but now there is a restriction that you can't be wearing heavy armor. And okay, that makes sense. The dash action over difficult terrain is identical. And the part about avoiding opportunity attacks, it's gone. Yeah, yikes, that was the best part of the feat. Oh, and now it has a worse name for some reason. So basically, we're trading the ability to avoid opportunity attacks for an ability score boost. I think the feat is still okay, and at least it doesn't shoehorn you into a melee build. So that's probably a good thing, I guess. But I am going to miss the opportunity attack free walking through enemies part for sure. I guess we can still disengage as a bonus action with cunning action though. Oh, and Speedster is a bad name. If mobile is going to show up as a higher level feed or something, then pick something else. Here, light footed. There you go. Use it free of charge. We're getting close, 90% of the way. Spell Sniper. I have never taken this feat in 5th edition. Some players used to take it to increase the range on Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade, but that trick got squashed in Tasha's. In 5th edition, it requires the ability to cast at least one spell, doubles the range of spells with attack rolls, allows ranged spell attacks to ignore half and three quarters cover, and allows you to learn one cantrip that requires an attack roll, and when you inevitably chose Eldritch Blast, it made you use Charisma for it. Now, it requires you have the spellcasting or pack magic feature. You now get an ability score increase to any of your mental ability scores. Bypassing cover remains the same. And then we have two important changes. First, casting in melee. Being within 5 feet of an enemy doesn't impose this advantage on your attack rolls with spells, so I guess this is the new feat to cast Eldritch Blast with in melee. Being within 5 feet of an enemy doesn't impose this advantage on your attack rolls with spells, so all the warlocks who want to cast Eldritch Blast in melee and used to take Crossbow Expert, now you take this. And second, instead of doubling the range of spells that require an attack roll, Instead, if the applicable spell has at least a 10-foot range, you can increase the range by 60 feet. And I read a comment from someone how this could be used with Poison Spray. No, it can't. I mean, unless they change Poison Spray to require an attack roll. But for design, I think this is fine. As for effectiveness, let's wait for spells. In 5th edition, we don't have a lot of leveled spells that require attack rolls. And most of them aren't great options. If that changes, this could be a pretty important feat for a character focused on those kinds of spells. Okay, so if you actually play with 5th edition, you're probably familiar with the features of Warcaster, but let's review them anyways. You need to be able to cast a spell to take the feat, provides advantage on constitution saving throws to maintain concentration when you take damage, it allows you to perform the somatic components of spells when you have your hands full, as long as one of those hands is full of a weapon or a shield, and when a creature's movement provokes an opportunity attack from you, you can use your reaction to cast a spell at them rather than making the opportunity attack as long as the spell was an action to cast and only targeted one creature. So, now, you need the spellcasting or pack magic feature and you get a mental ability score increase. The concentration feature is now better. The advantage to concentration saves now works regardless of whether the save is caused by damage or not. Reactive spell is almost the same, except there was a little loophole that was closed. Before, it said this was triggered if an opponent's movement provoked an opportunity attack, but now it specifies if the opportunity attack is triggered by them leaving your reach. I'll save you the little tricks this prevents, but it prevents some tricks. Finally, the somatic component portion of the feat hasn't changed, and it makes me wonder whether the components of the spells will change because there were some confusing interactions before regarding if a spell had a material component and no somatic component. I am hoping all that stuff gets simplified. A lot of DMs ignore that stuff now anyways, because it is a pain to keep track of. And number 30, at last, Weapon Training. This is clearly a redesign of Weapon Master, which you might have forgotten is even a feat. It provided an increase to your strength or dexterity and it gave you proficiency with four weapons of your choice, each of which had to be a simple or martial weapon. I guess to prevent you from gaining improvised weapon proficiency? 
Now the ability score boost is the same and you get martial weapon proficiency as a fourth level feat. Unless in 1 D&D martial weapons are a whole lot better than simple weapons, this seems like a pretty lackluster feat. I mean bards only get simple weapon proficiency now, but I'm thinking I'll be fine with a light crossbow and a short sword. Thank you. So I know this has been a marathon, so I'm going to wrap this up quickly by saying the video for first level feats and epic boons is coming next, and I will conclude that video with my overall thoughts regarding the feats we see in that video, as well as the ones you saw in this video. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon.